Benjamin, let me come uh, to you first. Uh, what else were the findings in this report? What was most shocking to you? Well, to me, this isn't so much a matter about gender. Obviously, the gender aspect is very important. We know that there's a wave of this stuff going on, certainly among young people, among youths. It's a, in some cases, it's a trendy thing to not be, you know, cisgendered and to have a very unique identity. And I do think that is tearing through schools. And I don't think it's entirely to do with identity. I think a lot of it is to do with fashion. Um, but I, I think the, the most worrying thing about this is the idea that it places the school or the state above the parents in terms of guardianship for that child. Ultimately, the parents are the people who are responsible for their own children, and the school is not in a position to turn around and say, oh, we know this information about your child who's come to us and said they want to change their gender, or they want to be known by a different name or different pronouns. When that happens, the school has a responsibility to tell the parents, and putting the state above the parents in this is really the most worrying thing. Thank you. Matt, let me bring you in. Um, I find very little to argue with there. If a child is expressing something as significant as saying, I want to be a different gender, change my name, change my uniform, the parents have a right to know, surely. Yeah, I think Benjamin, now I'm not sure what his expertise are on, on what's going on in schools, but certainly he's saying there that it could be fashionable, people changing their gender, or identifying as this or identifying as that. I'm not an expert on what's going on in schools, so I can't easily comment on that. What I will say is that instinctively, and I'm a, a, a young dad, well, I'm not that young anymore, but my son is young, he's only six months old, it's focusing my mind. Instinctively, I certainly, as a parent, would expect to be, would like to be, and actually would demand to be kept informed as to any changes in the gender of my son. It seems to be absolutely fundamental. Now, there, there may be, and this report acknowledges this, I think, there may be certain elusive circumstances, rare circumstances, in which a parent is not informed. I imagine that might be something like, you know, some sort of condition at home that is not conducive to the welfare of the child. There may be bullying, there may, there may be discrimination, there may be transphobia, whatever it, whatever it is. But broadly speaking, I have to say, I think the gender of your own child absolutely is your business as a parent. And it would be utterly absurd and quite damaging and dangerous if parents aren't kept in the loop by schools. Well, given that only 28% of schools are telling parents, Benjamin, why? Mm. I don't know. I think it might be the factor of trust with the student. They want to maintain an element of trust. If a student comes to them and says, uh, this is the way I feel and I, I don't want my parents to know, so please don't tell them, then the teachers might be put in an awkward position where they don't want to lose the trust and the confidence of those children. But ultimately, it's not their place to make that decision. Mm. The parents are the, the primary guardians and the primary carers of the children, and they have a right to know. So, I, you know, whilst it's a tricky situation, perhaps for some teachers, um, I do think ultimately they have to tell the parents, even if it's a very difficult decision. The absolute foundation of safeguarding in schools is that a teacher should never have a secret with a pupil because therein lies all sorts of difficult and, and potentially abusive situations. So the fact that a teacher might be saying to a child, we can't, we won't tell mummy and daddy about this, is, is should, that's where the alarm bells should go off. And I think all credit to the policy, uh, to the think tank, the policy exchange for, for raising awareness of this. Matt, let me bring you on to Benjamin's point then about this whole um, trend, this kind of social contagion amongst teenagers to be g gender fluid or non-binary. Is that what's happening here, do you think, in your opinion, that, the, that it's a trendy thing to do and it gets kids' attention? I think one of the most important things in the culture wars that we're experiencing at the moment, and there are those who would say, Conservative MPs perhaps among them, that the only chance that the Conservative Party has of winning the next election is to allow these or provoke these, encourage these culture wars to rage. But it is absolutely essential, if that's going on in the background, that child welfare is is not affected negatively, that it's treated sensitively. Rishi, Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister himself, said this week in responding to this report and he expressed concern about it, that we must treat this sensitively. We have to help parents understand what's going on with their children, keep them in the loop. That's that's my view. But children cannot be the victims of an ever-widening toxic culture war. You just look on Twitter, you look on social media, and it's not clear how representative what goes on on Twitter or elsewhere, perhaps on Facebook, is of the country at large. But if you, if you were only to live in a social media 
world, God for offend, you would see terrible toxicity, huge amounts of hate on different sides of this particular culture war. If you look at people replying to tweets by J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, you'll find enormous hatred on both sides, people standing up for trans people, and people attacking trans people, people attacking gender ideology as they see that. We cannot allow our children, you have children, Bev, I have children, yeah. We cannot allow our children to be to be the victims of that. We have with the policy on what goes on here in gender, something as sensitive and important as gender, has to be done sensibly, responsibly, sensitively, so that they don't become the victims of this. It is a confusing time, Benjamin, and I imagine it's confusing actually for a lot of teachers as well, because there is we do talk about the transgender issue so much, and it is so divisive, as Matt said. We had the shooting, obviously, um, in America earlier this week, and it was identified quite quickly that the, the, the girl the, who identifies as a boy um, who carried that out was transgender, and that was seized upon to entrench people further into their particular positions on this. Um, I wrote an article for the GB News website, actually, which is up there at the moment. So I, I did quite a lot of investigation into what's going on. And what occurred to me, Benjamin, that I didn't really know about is how much money is being made by the gender changing industry, the trans industrial complex, as it's called, particularly in America, in that they are seizing upon vulnerable youngsters who might be uh, maybe gay or they're just having confusing issues about where they sit on their sort of sexuality spectrum. And it feels like there's a whole industry now happy to leap onto that child and to encourage them down a path which might make a lot of money for some people, but it's not necessarily in their best interest. I don't feel like we talk about that side of it enough. Absolutely. I do think there's a lot of money to be made and places like the Tavstock Clinic, for example, I think they will incur the condemnation of future generations when they look back and realise that certain people who may have just had certain issues which were psychological rather than physical were being given these life-altering, irreversible treatments to make money. And it's like, much like the plastic surgery industry. There's a lot of controversy now about things that went on over the past century where people who had certain insecurities were being given things Things, you know, like a certain, uh, you know, modifications, which actually ended up giving them serious long term health problems and, you know, seriously damaged their lives. And they looked back years later and realized it was a huge mistake. So there is certainly that profit thing. But then I think when it comes to children specifically, it's so much worse. I mean, plastic surgery, those are consenting adults making bad decisions. And yes, they may have been preyed upon. But when it's children, I think it's far more sensitive an issue. And I think they really will be judged by history. Yeah. Um, Matt, as you said, you're, you're a, a relatively new dad and, and it's sort of one of those issues. It's there, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, we never know how our children are, are what curveballs are going to throw us um, as they get older. But if your child came to you one day and said, I'm not sure that I am the gender that I was born, how would you handle it, do you think? So I, I would be sensitive to, to my son. And if, if it turned out, and I've got no experience of what it might feel like to be in the wrong body, so I've got no, no experience of that whatsoever. I've, I've encountered very few people who are trans in my life, and I'm 43 years old. So I'm anything but, but an expert. Mm -hmm. And I think some humility on the parts of all of us, particularly political commentators, as we, as we discuss this, is really important. But if my son turned out to be trans, and after proper conversations, medical consultation, and all the rest of it, therapy, it turned out that that's what he, he was, that he really felt that he was a, a girl, I would mm -hmm. I would support him in that. I would I would celebrate him in that. What I don't want as a dad, and I, as you said, I'm only a new dad, only six months into being a dad, so my mind is being focused on it. What I don't think I want as a, as a dad is for my son to be encouraged to explore his gender, to question his gender. Mm -hmm. I don't want other adults, teachers or whoever, imposing that on my child. And I feel that quite strongly. I may change my mind because I think we have to be open-minded. That's where I am at the moment. I think when we look at this conversation more widely, I talked about the toxicity and the hate. There is a lot of blatant transphobia about, the, the sort of what you would have found in the 1980s, not dissimilar to homophobia, racism, sexism, misogyny. A lot of people are jumping on the feminist element in this just to vent their bigotry. Now, that's not to say that there aren't real issues. One real issue, and we've just touched on it, is whether a child should make, be able to make irreversible changes to their, to their body before mm. the age of 18. I'm not an expert, but instinctively, I would certainly raise questions about that, even though 
If you're not allowed to do that, you might suffer as a genuinely trans child. Another big issue, of course, is safe spaces for women. And I'm a man. I'm privileged in so many ways. And it's very difficult for me to comment on that because I haven't experienced six foot three, 17 stone. I, I'm not used to being in a changing room where I feel vulnerable. So we have to listen to women who do feel vulnerable, who are concerned about that. And I think there is a genuine strand to this that isn't transphobic, that is, but is concerned to protect hard won rights for women. This is nuanced. It's difficult. Let's talk about it with kindness and mm. not with bigotry. Uh, Benjamin, let me just, last word to you then. Do you see a time when we can talk about this calmly? Well, the three of us have just done it, let's be honest. Um, and I think I would like to move to a time when rather than looking at the individuals, we are looking at the forces at play, be that ideological, be that undermining the sanctity of, the, of our biology, for whatever reason that suits the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, last word to you, Ben. Yeah, I think it's uh, certainly such a controversial and politicized and weaponized issue. I don't think there really is a way of talking about it civilly. Um, you can try, but at the moment you say something totally reasonable and totally yeah. civil, a lot of people will jump on you and pile on. I mean, we see this on places like Twitter. You make a, a very innocuous tweet on the issue and there's a massive pile on from certain groups of people who delight in getting outraged about this sort of stuff. So even if you come in good faith and attempt to talk about this in the most positive, civil, o open, welcoming way, you will get absolutely lambasted and bombarded by people on the internet or wherever else. Yeah, well, people are perpetually offended, aren't they? Uh, Matt Stadlin, Benjamin Lochney, thank you very much for giving it your Saturday afternoon uh, to chat to me here on GB News.